That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. Writer, director Mark Dobson and and actor uh, Don Hanna. Are, you're here. You're sitting in in the Magical Thread Studio. It That's is magical. This is. Don't you it, is magical it is a bit Don? magical. Thanks and, for having us. Yeah, yeah. And, and Don, you're wearing a a, a NASA shirt and, and a Chicago Bears hat. That's right. So 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 you're two in, things I'm very passionate about. And a, NFC NFC so Central, much. right? Is that what it is? First NFC place, C- NFC. Central. Yeah, first place. Okay, well, all right. Well, then the Detroit Lions. That's my team <laughs> from where I grew up. Um, the Detroit Lions. We have a motto: It's not over till we lose. <laughs> so that's right. keeping the Wonderful. faith on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh... Never been to the Super Bowl. Never, you know, just never been to the Super Bowl. So clearly, we have well, no chance to win one. Buy a ticket like everybody else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We but, always had a motto in Chicago called "Wait until next year." <laughs> right. Yeah, well, but you guys have Fail had. Safe. I mean, look, the Chicago Bears have a storied history in the NFL. So, and the Detroit Lions will someday. That's so, right. yes, yeah. of course. But okay, so you guys are the filmmakers behind the landing, which when this came across the transom, the film thread transom, um, I, 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 I leapt at it because I just love anything to do with NASA, the moon landing, and um, I, I feel like you're at a good place because your film is coming out at exactly the same time as another film about mm. a moon landing, First Man, yeah. starring Ryan Gosling. What do you think of your competition? Well, first I want to, two things. Um, yes, Don is the executive producer of the film, the star of the film. Uh, there's a third filmmaker, David Dotson, right. uh, who's my brother, who co-wrote and co-directed it with me, and I just want to make sure that we... Twin brother. Yeah. The, oh, oh, okay. Twin brother. Wait, wait, really? But oh, just want to wow. make sure we mention him, because he's uh, in, currently in Ukraine, uh, oh, okay. directing a romantic comedy. Very different thing for him. Gotcha. Um, but he is here in spirit, and just want to make sure we understand that he was, you know, the person who really sort of kicked off the, this new feature version of The Landing. Right. Uh, about First Man... Uh, it is an entirely a coincidence that we're uh, being distributed and released at the exact same time. You know, our movie was actually completed in late 16 before First Man was even greenlit. Um, and then we had our film festival year in 2017 uh, and then uh, acquired our distributor earlier in January this year. And it, it just takes that long to get a movie uh, into theaters and then into VOD. So the timing is extraordinary. Um, and I'm actually, I mean, Don can speak to this too I mean I, we're actually happy about this because awareness of NASA and uh, all things space with SpaceX and you oh, know. very much so yeah. I mean if you just walk outside the night before last and if you guys living in LA you see a launch happening right you see a launch and a landing happening which had never happened before nobody's ever landed a, sta- a first stage back on the planet back on a hard landing. They were using the drone ship before, much more complicated. But now to launch and land at the pad right next door where it blasted off, what, 20 minutes earlier? And, Unbelievable. And, and we're not too far from seeing our first passenger Man. that paid for a ticket on a yeah. flight to the moon, right? Are they going, they're, they're, well, yeah, that's, 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 that's an aspirational fee right, he paid. What we are going right. to see yeah. is U.S. astronauts leaving U.S. soil again yeah. in early 19. And that's going to be in the Dragon, I believe, yeah. in the, the Dragon. The two. It's in the, it's in the SpaceX Dragon right. and in the, um, the Boeing's uh, but star we've liner. We've attended yeah. launches. And yeah. we've attended historic launches. We went to the last launch of the shuttle. Mm-hmm. We attended the first non-government um, citizen to be given his astronaut wings when, he won the, when they won the X Prize out at the Mojave Desert when, uh, uh, when, when the, uh, Dick Rutan designed yeah, uh, a, Spaceship Richard Branson, One. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, before Branson was even involved, actually. They had to launch it and land it twice to, in order to win the, what, the oh, right, $3 right. million dollar yeah, prize. Yeah. And we X-Prize blasted out to the desert to see that. Act, and, and we'd also seen several landings because they would land it. At Edwards. Yeah, the space yeah. shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. So we went out there and saw the. Saw that. Well, so you guys are legit NASA, NASA nerds. You didn't, you oh, know, God, you're not yeah. just wearing the t shirt. You're, no, you're, no, we like, walked the walk. I, you know, we, I was, I grew up in Dallas. Uh, mm-hmm. And, um, you know, back then, and, and I always just talked to Don about this. We had the same experience. Back then, you could write to NASA as a kid, you know, with your little scrawl and say, I really love Apollo, send me stuff. And they would send you a big manila envelope full of eight by tens and 
press kit materials and stickers, stickers. I mean, artist renderings, artist right. renderings, and all that. And you would just get as much as they could send out. I mean, it was incredible. And so we both had the same stuff. I was just stacks of these eight by ten glossies now, of the. I, it was incredible. I, I, I'm right there with you. I mean, yeah. um, one of my. We were talking about First Man before we started recording the podcast, but. Um, you know, I, my, my dad was a huge NASA nerd. We watched Star Trek together and we get into all sorts of nerdy conversations. But I have a vivid memory of my father sitting in front of the TV saying, we landed on the moon. We landed on the moon. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I, I, I'll never forget that memory of my dad because he was in his underwear. Literally white <laughs> t-shirt and tidy whiteies <laughs> pointing at the TV saying, we landed on the moon. Uh, exci- but like, I was, was at summer camp that summer, summer of 69, uh-huh. in Colorado. And um, it was a very rustic camp where we lived in cabins and backpacked and had horses. And, and I, I was in my tidy whiteies also, <laughs> much like your father, standing on the roof of my cabin, looking at the moon, just hoping, praying I could see something. I knew I couldn't, but, but I couldn't help but stare at the moon and my dad was at the launch of 11 because he was on the advanced team with Agnew at the time oh, so wow. yeah so. well well uh, uh, just to uh, real quick thoughts non-spoiler on first man although i will say it's hard to say non-spoiler we know what happens right <laughs> yes, yes it's about the experience let, let me right. say what and and this movie completely not you cannot compare it to what you guys achieved, which is a different type of amazing achievement, which I want to get into sure. for a specific reason, because there's something incredible that you guys did, which I want to find out was by accident or planning or how you did this amazing feat that's, that's, uh, that I think is just spectacular. Uh, with that kind of build up, real yeah, quick yeah. On, on First Man, um, it, it's the closest you'll get to feeling like you have been on an Apollo mission. I mean, it really is like this incredible, like, you are on this, you're, uh, wait, I, got, I, 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 I can't talk right now. I, I, you're, you're, and it really has to do mostly with the use of sound because the perspective of the, you know, we're normally used to, it's like, oh, and here's the amazing exterior view of the vehicle that you're seeing third person going into space. Nope. The movie is point of view and often first person point of view um, uh, of, of Neil Armstrong. So you're seeing this weird cockpit that you're cramped into that has maybe kind of a window here and a little window there. And that's all you get. That's you see the, the, the missions from from Neil Armstrong's POV, right? You feel it and the sound, this is going to this is going to win the Oscar for best sound design, sound editing, all of that. It's the sound is frightening and incredible. I mean, it's epic. Make sure you see the film in 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 IMAX too. Yeah. I I've seen it in IMAX twice. It's it's fantastic. So, um you get the feeling that you've 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 gone on this adventure. So you've got the and then when you get to anything outer space, it's a silence where you could hear a pin drop, right? Because it's the vacuum of space. There's nothing you can't. I mean, nothing makes a sound, right? Sound is no way to travel. So yeah. so, it, it, from a technological achievement, it's it's really amazing. And it also takes you back to an idyllic sort of Camelot era of American history. Um, and there are things that you learn about Neil Armstrong personally that I don't want to talk about because they're a bit on the spoilery side. Um, but it's a technical achievement. It's the closest thing to feeling like you've gone to the moon. And um, there are moments where you will be scared because these vehicles, they're in tin cans. These guys were brave. And you see one of the things that happens, and you guys know this, I don't need to tell you and you guys anything about NASA history, but for the members of our audience and potentially Anthony Ray Bench, who's sitting next to me, looking at me in a quizzical way, um, this was, you signed up for the space program, it wasn't a guarantee you were gonna live. Spam in a can. Yes, you're, yeah, spam in a can. These guys were put into, and you saw how unsophisticated, when you got like looks at what they created, I mean, it got better as they went with the Mercury, you know, uh, Gemini, and then Apollo. Um, they're, it was really unsophisticated. These are just cans of metal. Yeah, and, and you realize that you know, when you go to, I mean, anyway, you go to the Smithsonian, you go to Johnson Space Center, and you see the actual flight articles that have returned, uh, they, they do look like, look like tin cans. And um, 
I mean, and Armstrong himself, I mean, you know, he bought the farm very nearly a couple of times. I mean, yeah. on his Gemini mission with Dave Scott, which went completely haywire. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, flying what they called the flying bedstead, which was the trainer for the lunar module. Uh, he had to eject out of that. He almost bought the farm then. Um, but uh, most people think that it was his behavior as commander of the Gemini mission that actually got him the Apollo 11 command because he was so cool during that crisis uh, and managed to get them back uh, despite almost passing out from the rotations. And that, they decided, well, we want, that's the guy we want landing on the moon because he's going to, you know, I mean, he's going to uh, be able to handle whatever uh, comes at him. Well, it's, it's, it's I mean, the, the one thing also um, with, with, I mean, I, I had to go to YouTube after going to see First Man to double check, you know, on like how factual and a lot of it, they almost ran out of fuel just landing on the moon. Yeah, I mean, very close. They could have. They there. There's so many points at which they could have died. It's shocking that this was pulled off. And what was the the two things? One, I, I was confirming a lot of facts um, uh, that were in the film and learned a lot of really interesting things. For example, Buzz Aldrin, when he's coming down the ladder and and gets on the moon, pees himself. He urinates, and then the the bag broke and all the urine landed in his in one of his boots all that's where all the urine went so it was there's all sorts of weird just bizarre uh uh facts that if you go down that rabbit hole but what's very disappointing is that there are still people who do not believe that we landed on the moon and and there are and it's shocking to me the people that seem to believe that it was faked that Kubrick something had something to do with it. Somehow Stanley Kubrick's name always comes up. And yeah. I find it ridiculous that people still feel this way, that it didn't happen. Yeah, this is something that, that Don and I have encountered a lot at, at film festivals where people, in Q&As, people ask questions. And one question that always comes up is, is about that very thing, about, you know, was it faked? And do you guys actually believe it happened? And, and we're always at great pains to emphasize something which I think most people forget, which is that in 1969, we absolutely had the technology to go to the moon. But we did not have the technology to fake going to the moon. <laughs> that's, and, <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. I mean, if you if you look at uh, if you watch like 2001: A Space Odyssey, it's gorgeous as a work of art. It looks nothing like the reality of being on the moon in 16G. Yeah. Right? It's got people walking around slowly in traditional fashion. And nobody's really duplicated. No what people bouncing around on the moon look like. No, they haven't. With they, they, the claimed, they claimed they claim to have done. It. The, the other interesting thing was you know that the moon landing was shot in HD. But we didn't receive it in HD. We had just our uh, 300, you know, lines per inch, you know, cruddy mm. televisions, mostly black and white at the time, right? But it was shot in HD. That's why we have so many, uh, you know, uh, beautiful films after. But, but um, uh, I, I really feel that your film, The Landing, and First Man would make a great double feature. So you should... Go see absolutely, and it's and I've seen it three times now. First Man, um, one of my favorite films this year. Absolutely, go see First Man. Then the landing is available on VOD. It's it's yeah. all, all, iTunes, the, all the Amazon, digital, all the digital yeah, platforms. But. So let's talk about that because there is. Let's talk about your film. Well, when these bet, guys came to me and told me that Damien Chazelle had decided for his next project, after having done such a beautiful job with Whiplash and La La Land, that his next project was going to be a story about Neil Armstrong, one of the only two Apollo astronauts that I've actually met. I've met the first and the last man on the moon, which wow. is Neil Armstrong, who actually had a home in the town I live in, Telluride, Colorado, and also Eugene Cernan when I was there at South by Southwest, and he was there with a film called Last Man, which have you oh, seen? That's an excellent documentary. Yes, by the way. yeah. And so when they told me that, I'm like, fantastic, you know, because it's it only benefits us as filmmakers to be in the same conversation. And also, there's so many things that are happening that are NASA related right now. As you know, there's the mm -hmm. 60th the, the 60th anniversary. We're about to put U.S. astronauts back in space on U.S. soil and U.S. from from U.S. soil and U.S. built ship where um, we just introduced those astronauts to the public. We just landed one the other day. I mean, it's so many things that are happening. That, are, that And there's more coincidence that I think that Mark Dotson can address more eloquently than I can that about 
politically about this film and how it's landing in this time as well. Yeah, just in relation to First Man, I would just say that you know drama is about contrast, and First Man and the landing provide uh, a very stark contrast when you're looking at the two characters, Neil Armstrong and Bo Cunningham, uh, one representing the better angels, I would say, and one perhaps representing the, the darker angels. So you're right. I, I believe it'd be a great double feature uh, because you would really get the two sides. And the two movies are, as you know, are going after a completely different game. I mean, right. no, you can't. So, that's what I'm saying. You can't. Yeah. Compare, it's the same, the same space, but you can't compare them. I mean, it's um, to me, the landing is like a, a great Twilight Zone episode, right? Like, yeah. like it's that aspect, but with just like tons of great, like nerdy NASA stuff. So, okay. So imagine for a moment, Mark, you and I are, are at the video store. First of all, imagine that there is a video store. Oh, yeah. We're right, at yeah. the video Best store. I, I, I'm, I'm conf- It's a Saturday night. I'm looking for a movie recommendation. Pitch me the landing. I would say if you're there with your girlfriend, she's going to want to watch something that's true crime, right? And The Landing is probably the ultimate true crime film because uh, it is also a kind of social crime in itself. It is subversive for reasons which I'm sure we'll get into um, and uh, leaves you asking questions not just about what happens in the film, but about the film itself, about its very existence. Um, uh, and I think, it's, I think it's a darn good uh, thriller in the sense of, of you know, wanting to know what happened. I mean, if you saw Errol, Errol Morris's film, The Thin Blue Line, mm-hmm. you know, that was the two films share a kinship. It's kind of told in that style. It's, it's, ex- it's, it's absolutely intentionally told in that style uh, because the, the, the goal uh, was to tell this really great story. Now, as Don will attest, we, we didn't necessarily realize as we were making it that people would, um, would believe that this was 100% true. And when we first screened it, yeah. uh, when we first screened the 40 minutes, oh, yeah, this short, was, this great. Uh-huh. which is like the, the, the first short that needed an intermission because it was a <laughs> really long, 40 yeah. minute short film, the original <laughs> film, The Landing, in 93 or 94, Four. I believe it was, in, in West Hollywood. <clears throat> I went up and introduced the film and I said, Nothing that you're going to see tonight actually occurred. And people laughed me off the stage. And then afterwards, they're like, oh, yeah, we remember this. And one thing that's been consistent through the entire life of this film in any theatrical setting that we've shown it is that 60 to 70 percent of the audience believed that this occurred and immediately went to, they were all opening their phones up right away to try to find out about it. See, that's the, well, you know what, I, I, I have to say, Don, it's a testament to your acting in it. Oh, yeah. Amen. As I, Amen. As I sit here with you now, you could tell me aliens just landed on Melrose <laughs> Avenue, and I would... You have this, like, commanding voice and this intensity that... I mean, I was excited that you were going to be here when we were doing the podcast, but, like, you in the film, I mean, you sell it. Like, I believe it. And this, just and to be to be clear, like, about... So you guys made a short film, The Landing, in the early 90s, what, 90... 94, 95, and right after 90. we finished that, uh, we immediately start talking about how we might be able to make that into a feature. And one of the things we talked about uh, was that if we waited long enough, then there might be some really interesting things that we could do. And then around 2015, David, the other uh, collaborator, uh, basically came to us and said, I think this is the time to do this. I mean, everybody's still alive. We should actually uh, act on these ideas. And we had a red. Yeah. 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 And then we, we, had, we had a quick availability to a red camera. So, and- yeah. And I gotta say, uh, the first time I watched it, it was kind of uh, in the background and I was working on other projects. I legitimately thought I was watching a a documentary until you guys mentioned the Apollo 18. I was just like, wait, (laughs) wait, like it, it, it feels and looks like yeah. a documentary. It really does. Yeah, this is a testament to Don Hanna. I'm going to say a few things about Don Hanna that he would not say about himself. <laughs> we, <laughs> He's right the here. very first thing that we did was we went to Don's house in Telluride and we sat down and we interviewed him in character exactly as if uh, we were interviewing the actual living person of Bo Cunningham. Don did not have a script. I had a list of questions. I talked to him in character as an interview uh, talking to Bo Cunningham, the astronaut. And we did that for about three or four days. And everything that you hear from Don is him channeling 
the character of Bo Cunningham. Every once in a while, of course, we would stop, we would discuss about what we thought the next thing should be, but everything that you see uh, is, it's one of the most pure examples of actual method acting that I could have ever seen. It's him being that person and bringing all that information from his, his knowledge of NASA, but most of all, his knowledge of the character and what the character would say. Half of his rants, all these things that he says about the moon rocks and all that stuff, this, this, is, this is Don Hanna doing that. And after we had shot those interviews, David and I went back and looked at it all and said, okay, well, now we have a movie. I, I mean, so, so did you start with a script or at least an outline, like a script? Mm, or was you started it? with a story. Uh, what we started <laughs> yeah. with, really, was a location. If yeah. you really want to, you want to go back to go back to 95. I'm, you know, part of my interest in NASA, you know, stems from when I was a kid. When I got my first silver space shoot and, and helmet, my dad went out and went skydiving. Well, as soon I was determined that as soon as I was old enough, I would start skydiving. When I moved to L.A., the first thing I did is in the back of the weekly was an ad for skydive today. I drove out to the Mojave Desert and I became um, a skydiver and was jumping and I had 1,200 jumps. Well, I was jumping and, um, and I would hang my head out the door flying up to altitude and I would ask my instructor, Jeff McVeigh, who is Al Borden in this film, he was my skydiving instructor and, and buddy, where, what I was looking at out the door because it was gorgeous and he goes, oh, that's Red Rock Canyon State Park. Didn't you know they shot Planet of the Apes and Capricorn One there. I'm like, aha. Uh-huh. Capricorn so, uh, One. So I, I love drove out there and I called Mark and I said, We're getting in my car and driving out to the desert. You have to see that. He was writing a screenplay that was an that was a about a love story that occurred in the NASA era. And that was the background. And I'm like, You've got to see this place. This is where they shot this stuff. Oh my god. And we went out there and we that and the story evolved. From the location. Yeah, really. because, because you really, that location, and one of the reasons it's been in everything, I mean, we could sit here all afternoon and name movies, it's been in the big country and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Jurassic Park and on and on and on. But the reason people shoot back there is because very close to the major highway, once you get back in there, you can shoot 360 degrees and you have no idea that you're where, anywhere near. Where, where is that exactly? You drive north like you're going to... Uh, uh, Mammoth. Mammoth. So you pass Palmdale I, I drove Lancaster, through there. I drove through there. And, and they shot Mojave, tremors there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tremors, the movie oh, yeah. Tremors. Yeah, no, yeah. The, the list is, is huge, and it, uh, frankly, it's, it's shot out at this well, there's, point. There's right? actually, well, there's actually, if you drive through there, because I, I stopped on the way to the, uh, uh, we went to the Mammoth Film Festival earlier this year, and if you drive through there, there's a museum, and they even do a film festival there, and the museum has, like, they've shot Quentin Tarantino's shot there, yeah. they've shot Star Trek episodes there and Star Trek movies like it's like as you pointed out it's it's everything it really is like like, once you get in the thick of it there's there's nothing there is nothing to be seen so it's 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 really incredible so if you were Um, to take if you were to like describe the landing in high concept terms one way you could do is you could call it the Blair Witch Project meets Capricorn One that's that's a that's a perfect description and especially if you're i mean capcorn one is a classic i think it's uh one of those like what it's it's like uh, uh an old sci-fi that that i know and i like mm-hmm. it gives to me credibility to anyone that also knows it oh, like the movie Gould's in it right yeah so. yeah exactly right. well yeah or like uh when you mention movies like uh say like a crawl or something like right, that right. it's like well if you remember crawl you're good in my book but capricorn <laughs> one is also a really good deep cut but yeah it is like a blair witch project well, meets capricorn one which the capricorn one is about faking a, a yeah, landing right like now of like course, that's uh, yeah i mean i mean of course the, the the landing does not in any way suggest that we did not go to the moon. Right, right, uh, true. Nothing like that. Um, but as far as um, uh, accessing conspiracy uh, theory uh, uh, type of a vibe, sure. Uh, to be clear, uh, the movie is not, landing is not a found footage film. It's very much right. in the Errol Morris documentary sense. But as far as trying to achieve a sense of reality that fools the audience into thinking, thinking it actually happened, Don's absolutely correct. I mean, it, it, uh, it, uh, it and, the proof is, as we see when we screen the film. But Don, also, it's the fact that you, you're in that footage. You're in the recreated footage, right? You're in it. And then we're seeing you now, you know, in, quote, present day, although present day is technically the late 90s, right? Or Correct, yeah. Something like that. It, 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 it's like, I mean, you could not have planned it better yeah. if you planned it that way. Oh, I mean, no, that's we, what, that's we, a, we out boyhood boyhood by... 
about right exactly 12, about 12 years we they were like 12 years and we're like 25 so yeah i mean it's a, it's an incredible opportunity because i kind of felt that it's like i wonder if these guys just made a short film and just decided like later and it, it but it completely works i mean you totally pull it off well that's a tribute to to mark and david's commitment to this piece because this was it's been a challenge even when we made the short film it was a challenge because we didn't record production sound we thought because we thought we were going to do everything ah. in voiceover. So they went back and lip read every single frame of that movie. Yeah, that was fun. In order oh just God. to get some background, and we went in with scripts into a studio, the Evergreen Studio, I believe, mm -hmm. and um, in, in in North Hollywood, and recorded the production sound from the first film. <laughs> So, oh I mean, and then and then and then when it came to doing the you know putting us inserting us into the actual NASA pictures and NASA photographs, that was another massive undertaking which made Mark drive cross country to get photographs from all of our stories. Yeah, because all the as you know in the film, many different people are interviewed: FBI agents, the flight director, the wives of the astronauts. So, in order to create the historical photographs we had to go to all of our actors and say, I need every photograph that was ever taken of you 25 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, and then you take all those pictures, and then you look through your catalog of hundreds, thousands of NASA and vintage photographs and see which ones uh, of those might match up with the photographs we got from the actors and to try to create, as you know, there's, there's probably 300 uh, those p kinds of pictures and in the movie. Finding the actors, some of the actors after 25 years, yeah, another challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. So, um, well, that's our, the only thing Facebook's good for, right? No, you can no, find. Listen, we have really? Arlene, Mar Ar Ar Arlene Mar Marquez, Martinez, Ar Martinez um, um, who plays uh, um, Ed Lovett's widow in this, was part of the original film, and you can see her in the original film, and um, and her husband was a catcher for the Toronto Blue Jays and is now the announcer and was the manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. But we had no way of getting in touch with her because we couldn't find her on Facebook. And so Mark tracked her down through an autograph website. Yeah, there's an autograph <laughs> website <laughs> where, where, for old ball players, right? Yeah. So I found there's Buck Martinez and there was an address which somehow was their home address in Clearwater, Florida, wherever it was. So I wrote a snail mail letter to it uh, to that address and then gave my email address and that was how he tracked it down but that took months I mean it took months and months and to, uh, finally we're trying thrilled to thrilled to be back and, and, yeah. and part of the film again we still haven't found the original DP yeah. from the film yeah, the original cinematographer is, is disappeared off face of the earth yeah. much like Bo Cunningham did for that mysterious 10 days <laughs> well see this is the weird thing like okay we sitting in this room we know NASA history we know right. just from I mean I built model kits when I was a kid I like I I, I, I was obsessed Obsessed with reading about it, I, I, you know, you know, and I'm, you guys were the same, right? You got the model kits, exactly the same, you know, like you dream about it, you'd, you'd look at the model kits I couldn't afford to get that I wanted to get, and this, and the, you know, all the different, you know, the just obsessed with every aspect of it, and that kind of it dissipated, right? So, so when people, you know, modern audiences are watching this and they're questioning the history, it's just because they didn't grow up with it. Right? That's it. And it's the time, right? I mean, we're now talking, we're going to be 50 years out from the Apollo 11 landing next year. That's, that's, I don't know how, how's it counted? One generation, two generations, yeah. right? And so I think when people look back on it, there's, there's the time element. And then I think they sometimes conflate that with say the uh, Challenger disaster. So right. they know basically in their heads that some people, something went wrong, somebody got killed, but without the real historic base, They're it all wrong. gets mixed up. Right. There was one, there was yeah. 13, there were two shuttle disasters. Right. And so when they see our film... So it sounds kind of right. Yeah, we remember yeah, that, yeah. that happened. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, no one wants to sound stupid, so they, they blend it all together and go, sure, sure, I get it, yeah. Yeah, I'm 32 years old. I, I didn't grow up with that fascination with NASA, and I'm very ignorant when it comes to those things. My generation was all about the dinosaurs because Jurassic right. Park exactly. came out. Exactly, exactly. And that's what we learned. That's what we asked our teachers to, you know... Like, I remember we had an astronaut, and I can't remember his name because I was in, like, third grade. He came in, and just the, the reception from, like, the other kids were just like, ah, like, this guy's so boring. Um, oh, my God, that's so funny. I, I actually, I, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a, a kid because I thought what an astronaut meant was flying around in the Millennium Falcon with Chewbacca. And then... It's not wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and then I, I I found out that it's it's very dangerous, and I remember watching um, Apollo thirteen 
in theaters, and I was just like, no way, no way, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing that at all. Well, no, just to go down the nostalgia road just for a second, did you guys drink Tang because the astronauts did? I did. We didn't have we didn't have that particular libation in my house, so I don't know. I lived on Tang. I lived on Tang. Yeah, I, lived I, on tang. I I lived on Tang. I lived on Tang. And space food sticks. Sp- I, I was had those. Bring up I did have those. Space food sticks space from food sticks. from Pillsbury. Yes. They were these. Basically, they were like Tootsie Rolls. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And Chewy. I don't. I, in foil wrappers. In foil wrappers, and it was like the astronauts. I mean, you could just you know look up on Google Images space food sticks. Space it's food sticks. space food sticks. That and Tang, I was obsessed with. It's like I wanted to. What, what the astronauts did, I wanted to do that. I don't even know. Can you even buy Tang now? I wonder. Uh, I, think so. I think you can. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think so. Okay, now I now I have it's like called kombucha. <laughs> That's right. Had a branding uh, change. But it. but I what what's amazing and I think there's not an appreciation for now is m- so much technology we we enjoy today came from innovations from NASA. I mean, there was that series that Tom Hanks and Spielberg did from the Earth to the Moon, right. which you can only you can only get now as like a DVD box set overpriced on Amazon used because it's not on HBO. It was an HBO produced series that what I loved about that show was it talked about all aspects of uh, NASA. It wasn't just about the astronauts. It was about the guys who designed the LEM, right? It was right. the people, I mean like crazy glue was something that came from NASA. The technology that Velcro. powered VC Velcro LEDs hook and loop tape. Yeah. LEDs. What else? Um, VCRs, you know, so much technology Pocket calculator. Calculator, yeah. I mean, so many things came from NASA. I kind of feel like we've lost that. Like when you look at like the history of the United States, that was sort of our last great moment, right? Was well, that? They, and- they went and got every guy that had gone to engineering school or had an electronics degree or went to trade school or went to vocational school that were basically garage tinkerers that knew how to fix things that came out of the military. Yeah, that could actually do and build and make things whether they were doing hot rods or whatever they were doing they knew how to actually physically use the tools that they had gotten from their fathers and they could create things and when Kennedy dropped that gauntlet and said we are going to go to the moon before the end of this decade right they went out and just got those guys they found them and they and the cream rose to the surface Mm -hmm. and they were able to put them all in rooms and hack it out they used. They had less computer technology than by a, a, a thousandfold, or maybe a hundred thousandfold, than you have in your iWatch. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, it's just I I, I kind of feel like I mean we, we face more challenges today, I think than ever. It's it's disheartening to think that we can't throw a, a bunch of scientists in a room. I mean, maybe it's just sort of a lack of faith in science. Is this is this where our culture's gone now? We're arguing about global climate change as as a hurricane beats down on yeah. on Florida. You know, like I mean, it's just kind of nuts. I, I, I mean, it's that we're we're at this point. <clears throat> we're, we're, you're getting into a very complicated area. Yes, but um, obviously, when tribal concerns overwhelm right. everything else. Um, uh, people retreat into those spaces, and uh, back in the you know 60s and 50s, you know we had a common enemy, you know in the Russians, uh, which tended to uh, smear some of the other tribal uh, uh, affiliations within the country. Without right. that kind of enemy, uh, unfortunately, we are starting to sort of uh, you know go into our little factional areas, polarization, uh, yeah, and try to find um, new enemies, which unfortunately. And I won't go too much into into who I'm blaming here. Right, right. But um, there's one particular faction which tends to require enemies um, to uh, to rile up its its base. And so uh, the other things, technological achievement. Um, but by the way, this this is why, as Don was saying, you walk down the street and you see everybody wearing NASA shirts and all this stuff. It, what that shows is is that despite all this, there is a hunger, there is a deep, the, deep there, there need is. for thirst, that kind yeah. of a thirst for that kind of inspiration but, to be able to look past these things. Like I, I would, I think that Mark was starting to head towards is that there's similarities between what's happening in 2018 and what was happening in 1973, and I want you to address that. Yeah. yeah. So we, so obviously, as you know, in the landing. Um, we actually address why it is that you, the audience, have, has not heard of, of this particular thing. And the answer is, is that it happened at exactly the same time as Watergate. 
uh, Watergate overwhelmed the public's ability to deal with some of these other things, uh, such as the Apollo 18 uh, tragedy. And, um, and the attorney general and the chief of staff and the entire uh, political structure in place. The, the, entire, the, the entire, you know, uh, way in which the country dealt with its political situation. And, um, you know, and now, obviously, uh, uh, we're in sort of a similar uh, moment. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's, it's, you can see history repeating itself in many, many ways. And if there's right. a lack of attention being paid to um, some of the better things that we do, like space exploration, then, you know, that's po probably why. You know, obviously the movie, the story of Bo Cunningham, shares a lot of similarities with certain other political things that are going on right now. I mean, right. I always talk to people, and I, when we introduce the film, I always uh, say, you know, look, a, a movie takes a long time to make, so we can't actually know you know, the political moment that the film is going to come out in, but you may recognize a story about a man who was given great responsibility and almost certainly should not have been given that. Uh, and the carnage that results uh, because of that bad, very bad decision. So, um, uh, and what happens, you know, when, say, the... Uh, you know, there's a line that uh, the the, the um, congressman has where he says, oh, I refuse to believe that the White House would ever ask the FBI to stop a legitimate investigation. I mean, that line was written and performed <laughs> before the election. So uh, we just keep seeing more and more things um, begin to look uh, analogous to our film, which is very depressing in many ways. It, it's funny, but my, my only memory of Watergate, because I was a little kid, was that it preempted Saturday morning cartoons. <laughs> that some of the Watergate hearings actually bled into, and of course... You know, I grew up in an era where there was cartoons on one day. Right, Saturday. Saturday, Saturday morning. Saturday morning, that was it. That was it. Yeah, Saturday morning. Between like 7 a.m. and noon, you got the cartoon. After that, no more cartoons. Right. Go outside and play. Right. And don't bother it. to lock the screen door. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's, but I do think that what's interesting is uh, there's a generation now that I think probably knows more about the, f the, the theories about faking the moon landing than the actual moon landing. Oh, easily. You know, Absolutely. when I see there's so many, so many videos that have been produced about, like, um, someone's theory about how they faked it. And I think, like, you, you pointed out earlier, like, you know, uh, the, the, you know, they had the technology to land them. We didn't. They didn't have the technology to fake the moon landing. Not even close. And the problem is, is that, you know, the, the democratization of access to the media, like through YouTube and that kind of thing, right, right. has given all voices equal uh, status. Right. And we can argue all day about, about gatekeepers and who should be the gatekeepers and that kind of stuff. But the fact is that when we did have some gatekeepers, um, the wacky stuff got filtered out. But now, no matter how insane you are, you can start yelling and everyone will think that you have as valid a point of view as anybody else. Right, exactly. I mean, yeah. to say it is to give it life, okay? I believe that quote. To say it is to give it life. But just because I say that this object that I'm holding in my hand is a moon rock, and I yell it, and I say it, and I show it on television, and I, and I say, and if you don't believe me, you're wrong, right? That this isn't a moon rock doesn't mean it's right. And that's what we're looking at in media today. That's what we're looking at in the polarization of the political parties. Because whoever's yelling loudest and defending their position more, more vehemently are then, 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 then the attention is drawn to them. They're getting the most hits. They're getting the most likes. They're getting the most believability, which is frightening. And what, we're, and, what, and, and what we've done on a certain level is added to the fake news pile that's out there. Yeah, that's the scary part. I mean, that, and that's the part that we actually, Don and David and I talk about all the time. We always ask ourselves that if we had started this project you know, post-election, would we have opted to even make this film? Because mm. there's going to be now, and we already see it. I mean, there's going to be a certain number of people who will um, use this for their own ends to continue the idea that, you know, there's conspiracies and NASA's hiding things from you and the government tells, doesn't tell you everything and look at the Apollo 18 thing, and people will believe it. And that's not a good thing to inject into the, into the, the, the body politic right now, you know? So what you're saying is you're part of the problem. <laughs> are, but, no, but, but I hope we'll point out the problem. I think, you know, yeah, I, I think that what you do is we bring the problem into relief. Right, right. You know, that we are able to bring the problem into relief. Now, is this a moon rock that I'm holding in my hand in front of you? Guys? It, it looks like one. Okay, good. But it's not, right? It's right. not, but... It looks like a mini hockey puck. But it wouldn't be hard <laughs> to convince people that it is. 
right? Especially if I was actually holding a rock, any kind of rock in my right. hand. Because there's no way that you'd be able to prove that that's wrong. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. the movie is to show we're holding up this rock. Now, look inside yourself and see how easy it was for you to, to you know, succumb to that impulse to believe that it was a rock. You know, and, and hopefully it's a, it's a teachable moment, as we say. Because, you know, I mean, obviously, um, you know, there's no... I mean, the, the reason people see the movie and believe that it's true is because unlike other mockumentaries, pseudo-documentaries... You know, context is everything. When you see, you know, Spinal Tap or Documentary Now, the context is comedy. That tells right. you right off the bat that it's, that it's fake. Or there horror, is no or horror, or horror. Right. Or horror, right. That is not the case in The Landing. Right. The Landing no, it's, is straight documentary by any standard. And so there's no context to tell you that it's not real, except your own historical knowledge. And if you don't have that, you're, you're screwed. Because I mean, it's, we paid our taxes, we have the um, right yeah. to use this footage. It is, it is in the public domain. And so we, we use the footage to our end. Yeah, yeah. And we had decent intentions. You know, I mean, we didn't intend to fool anybody. The, the, the warning shot is what happens when somebody with really nefarious intentions decides to use the technology for really, really evil ends, like convincing people that there are more people on the you know, Washington Mall or whatever it is. You know, they'll be able to fake that stuff very, very quickly, and then we're in real trouble. I mean, here's the problem. As humans, we are very, very bad at deciding what technology benefits us and what technology does not. We have never come up with a single technology, someone can think of it, let me know, that we have not used. 1945, we used the most awful technology ever conceived, and we used it twice. This technology that we use to make the landing will be used by people uh, who want to do you harm. So hopefully the landing is a cautionary tale and you'll see it, and you believe it, and then you realize it's not real, and you go, holy crap, we better start paying attention to this, because it's, it was too easy. <laughs> it was but it's, too, but it's, a, it's, it's a highly entertaining thriller, and if you're, oh, a, if you're a NASA fan, if you're a fan of anything related to uh, the, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, th- it, this, is, this is also a great companion piece uh, to watch with First Man. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I believe it's just oh, no, I, I agree it's the it's it's you know an an indie an indie take uh uh it's an indie take in that realm let's just say that yeah yeah and it, and and it's a as an act of drama it's a an extraordinary uh, showcase for some extraordinarily talented actors who without their their work you would not believe this was happening right i mean you would not believe it's real without don hanna inhabiting well, Bo Cunningham without I, these people doing this stuff. And I have to say, uh, Don, a testament to your performance. It's so intense. I, like I say, you, I, I feel like hanging on your performance, it just, you just buy it. I think that's why people were pulling their phones out and trying to check if it was real or not. So It's interesting because the, dramatically, it, it, it's a very unusual film. I don't know if there's another film that I've ever seen where drama doesn't take place between two actors on the screen at the same time. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's usually all dramas in any drama that I've ever seen, any drama that you can go around or watch in a theater, takes place between two actors in the same room. And in this case, that's not, that's not it. It doesn't exist that way. So it's an interesting observation. Now, where can people find out about the film? Where, is there a website, yes. social links? So all kinds of places you can start, but I would start with uh, thelanding-movie.com. Uh, there you'll find links to either, you can go to link there to Amazon to buy the Blu-ray DVD. You can link to iTunes. You can link to Amazon. You can link to Google Play. Uh, or if you're sitting at home, uh, pick up your cable or satellite remote control on almost everyone. There is an on-demand button. You push the on-demand button, search for the landing. There you go. And rent it or buy it. You can rent, rent and it buy, or buy it right it. now. And then it's not on the it's on the transactional platforms. Right? And, what, and what about your social uh, your social uh, oh, uh, links? Uh, on Instagram, uh, the landing movie, I believe is the, at the uh, landing movie. That's landing movie on Instagram. Uh, on Facebook, just search for the landing. It'll come up as, as that film. And uh, and then uh, one more shameless plug. If you happen to be in Seattle, and particularly in uh, in on Bremerton, uh, on October twenty fourth. Uh, there's going to be a special screening of the film at the historic Roxy Theater, 
and afterwards uh, there will be a live webcast Q&A hosted by Robert Pine, father of Chris Pine, famous from Chips and from The Landing, who will be hosting this, and Don and I will again be uh, discussing the film. Right, and also if you go to the website, it is, we have a theatrical release um, uh, brought to us by My Cinema, which is a new technology. It's essentially like an Apple TV. It's a streaming device that, um, that theaters have to play independent films. And we, uh, The Landing has been selected as the uh, kind of tentpole fe uh, feature to launch that technology. And it's in about 50 theaters across the country right now and uh, expanding. And we'll continue to be in theaters uh, as well as on your local cable and Apple TV and all the various uh, platforms. And then when you get around to watching First Man uh, on Netflix, <laughs> and you'll see at the bottom where it says, people who search for this also watched, <laughs> right. doubtless uh, it'll be down there. So uh, as you say, it's, a, it's a, I think, a wonderful companion to everything that's going on now. Well, Mark and Don, uh, thank you for being on the Film Threat Podcast. Uh, congratulations on the film. Thank you so much. It was uh, it was extraordinary uh, to be here. You got your this NASA uh, enthusiasm is contagious, <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you so much. Yep, thank you very much. We're and, thrilled to be here, and may the force be with you. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> also with you. Hey, Chewie's in the house. Did you want them to die? Did you? What's the question? Did what I had to do. They didn't want a story running around that one of their astronauts, I think he was lying his ass off. I don't really remember it that way. I don't know what really happened up there. If I hadn't put us down there, there'd be three dead bodies still up there. They didn't want a story running around that one of their astronauts was a psycho. I put us back on Earth. No one talks about it. The country had two major screw-ups going on that summer. There was Watergate. The sitting president was essentially on trial. We have the Apollo 18 the possible disintegration of NASA. He brought it down by the seat of his pants. Hard landing in the middle of China. You could say that it was my fault that we landed where we landed, but you could also say it was my fault that we landed at all. First impression of Bo Cunningham. I guess that would be his eyes. Once they locked in on you, they never let you go. Bo just keeps to himself, but he has to deal with people stomping all over him. People hated his guts. He was a record breaker. He was a genius. He is a genius. With Bo, everything is business as usual. To me, that's the scary part. I don't think about Bo Cunningham. I was a flight director, I was his boss, but I was a little afraid of the guy. It was just a mandate to find out what happened and report that to the president. We just always believed that the FBI would be involved. You felt this was a criminal investigation. I did, absolutely. Cunningham has never answered for what he did. I've heard all the stories, and it's absolutely ridiculous. He just left them there to die. There's absolutely no truth to that whatsoever. It was a whitewash. He didn't even really try to make it look like anything else. No, I wasn't a prosecutor. I did what I had to do. When the truth is known, maybe I can move on. Does that answer your question? No way! That's great!